this is my first panel as a um, uh, Washington State Women's Commissioner. I'm so excited to bring you these very um, just great, uh, strong um, Native women who have been really working um, on the subject of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. But before I start, we have to do a little bit of business, which is um, we need to do a land acknowledgement. And that is important in our work to remember that all of the land that we all live on throughout this country um, belong to Indigenous people. And wherever you're at, you're on um, land that is Indigenous. And where that is, for me, is here in SWIM, is the land of the Sklalem people who I descend from. And we just always want to remember to thank the Indigenous people for caring for these lands um, since time immemorial. The Sklalem people, or New Sklalem, means strong people. And I want to thank them for this great land that we get to live on. And um, so today is the end of the National Week of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, but that doesn't mean our work is over at all. So I would like to um, introduce Teresa Sheldon, who is the Native American Political Director of the um, Democratic National um, um. Committee. Teresa, thank you for joining us. Hasla Hale, Teresa Sheldon Seed Sta, Twal Chud Du Flalap, Tigwid Seed, ACM to the Washington State Women's Commission. I'm Teresa Sheldon. Uh, like shared, I am coming to you from the traditional homelands of the Shtohob people, uh, known as Tulalip Tribes, where I am a citizen of. I am the current uh, DNC Native American Political Director, and so it is an honor to be here, share this space with all of you today and um, just uplift the good work that is taking place. And thank you to all of you um, who are here and who are continuing um, to get engaged. For those who are just learning, thank you for being here. Uh, we need you and we need you a part of this movement. Um, a lot of times when we talk about this issue, we, be we begin with statistics. We say um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are two and a half times as likely to experience violent crimes, at least two times more likely to experience rape or sexual assault crimes against them. 61% of Native Americans and Alaska Native women, two out of five, have been assaulted in their lifetime. Um, we start this work out with statistics because we're trying to prove how bad it is and why we need help. And we're constantly having to prove that our lives matter, um, the, the invisibility of Native issues um, are causing more death and more harm to our people and to our citizens. And that is, we just can't do this alone anymore. Um, we know crimes against uh, women and young girls are not a woman's issue, it's a human's right issue. And so the more we come together and work together on solutions, the better off we all are um, in the long run. So I'm sharing in the chat box um, an amazing proclamation by our President Biden, um, who hereby proclaimed May 5th, 2021, as the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Awareness Day. Um, he calls on all Americans and asks all levels of government to support tribal governments and tribal communities efforts to increase awareness of the issue of missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives through appropriate programs and activities. So it's an honor to see that we're uplifting this, um, the president's words. We, do, we know elections have consequences and we're seeing the fruits of that um, in this amazing statement put out that is literally two and a half pages long. Otherwise I would read it to you. I do have the privilege of sharing the DNC statement. Um, the DNC has put out our National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls as well from our DNC chair Jamie Harrison, our DNC Native American Caucus Chair Ryan Ramirez, our Vice Chair Paulette Jordan, and our um, Secretary Treasurer Keith Harper. For too long, Native We'll just give it a second and see if the unit with within the bureau. 
You were frozen for a second, Teresa. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's just appropriate that everything we talk about is about Wi-Fi <laughs> and the need for broadband <laughs> on tribal communities. Um, but really, enough is enough. And so we applaud President Biden. We applaud um, Secretary Holland for creating the Missing and Murdered Unit within the Bureau of Indian Affairs of Justice and Services and for providing this issue with the attention it deserves. Democrats remain committed to increasing safety and access to justice for American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian peoples by advocating for the necessary reforms to prevent future acts of violence. We must lift up the voices of surviving family members to fight for the justice that is overdue for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The time for change is now. And thank you for being a part of that change. And thank you for being a part of this movement for humanity. I want to say Tigwood Seed ACM. I appreciate the good work our representative um, Deborah Lankinoff is doing, Patsy Whitefoot, and Abigail on this call. And I just raise my hands up and say Tigwood Seed ACM. And may all of this good work come out into fruition for the protection of all. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for joining us and sharing those good words. Um, I am going to introduce the names of each of the panelists and have them tell, talk to us about themselves. And then um, we're going to talk about the work that has been done in Washington State, some of it related to the national work, but the work to establish the missing and murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Task Force and then our hopes for that. And I have already, already seen comments in the comment box wanting us to give call to action to people and let them know how to be involved. So it's, it's so good to hear that. So first, um, Patricia Whitefoot, would you like to introduce yourself, please? You're still muted, though. <clears throat> there you go. Oh. Okay, while I'm doing that, can you please put the PowerPoint? We'd appreciate it. Shiklawat, Ink Nashwinik Shesh Twapit, Ku Pashin Wiki, Patricia Whitefoot. Good afternoon. I introduce uh, myself from my homelands. I'm from the Yakima Nation or the Confederate Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. I live in White Swan and um, I'm currently here uh, in my grandchildren's home because I'm also involved with virtual learning as well with two grandchildren. So I travel from White Swan to Wapto, which is about 25 miles away from my home. And so you'll hear children screaming in the background, which is okay, so just ignore it. <laughs> and so uh, Vicki, do you have the PowerPoint? Um, Valerie, can you pull up the PowerPoint or Kate? I have a brief PowerPoint that I wanna share with you. And it's also work that I've been sharing uh, nationally as well in, uh, with the National Indian Women's Resource Center. Um, there, we've had a number of presentations that have been going on. And so I just wanna summarize some of the work that um, I've been involved with in my, not only in my community, but also at the federal level. I wanna apologize. I am working on getting it pulled up right now. We have a little unexpected technical difficulty, but we're just about there. Okay. Yep. okay. And, and this work also involves working um, not only here locally, but with, with outreach to folks like Abigail Eckehawk and also Teresa Sheldon, and uh, of course, Representative Lekhanoff. It takes all of us working together uh, to address this issue. And I'm so pleased to see uh, many of our friends and I also see my niece on here from Wyoming. I'm surprised that she's here and I'm so glad that she's here. Thank you, Tara, for joining us. I happen to see your name and family members as well. So I share the story of my sister, uh, Daisy Mayhe, who has been missing for several years now. And, you know, just following again, you know, the kind of statements that are made, we, we shout out, say her name. And so people respond by saying Daisy Mayhe. And she is a, uh, a citizen of the Yakima Nation, but she's also Warm Springs. And so I'm the older sister. Daisy was the youngest sister. The next present slide, please. <clears throat> so 
So I've been working with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, but also just doing work on my own um, and with my family. And so currently I'm working on a, a guide with uh, regarding when women go missing. And the title of it is When a Loved One Goes Missing. And I've been working at the NIWRC with Paula Julian, who's native uh, Filipina. I'm sorry, I didn't correct that. She corrected me and said she's Filipina. She's a senior policy specialist there, as, as well as Rose Quilt, who's a Yakima tribal member. She's the research and policy director. And I also just want to acknowledge my sister because if, you know, if it wasn't for this unfortunate situation, I wouldn't be here, but I would probably still be here because I have many uh, family members who have either gone missing or have been murdered. And as I begin to take a look at the list uh, here on the Yakima Reservation, uh, you know, I can call out the names of those individuals that I'm related to. So I wanna acknowledge my family and, um, and friends of the, of the Yakima Nation and also of the Warm Springs tribe as well. And my niece that's on the line, she's from Warm Springs, but she's teaching in Wyoming on the, the Wind River Reservation. <clears throat> the next slide, please. So when you're putting together you know, a flyer or information for the databases, you have to go back and you know, find all of the kinds of uh, supporting information that you can in, in putting my sister's name in the national database with NamUs. I gave them her name, date of her birth, and when she was reported missing. And at the time she went missing, she was 29 years old and she was living with me. So she was last seen in White Swan, where I'm from, and you have to put down the race. And of course, you know, we, we were categorized as American Indian. In this case, I wanted to make certain I got her tribe in there. And then the gender, you know, height, weight, features, long black hair. I didn't put down that she had a, you know, a scar on her, it was her left side on her arm from an accident when she was a child. She was hit by an elderly man who didn't see her. And then contact information. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so I've been sharing this information uh, all along during, you know, uh, about her, just so people get to know her. And for a while, we, we couldn't locate photos. And one of my sisters that I've been working with had photos. And so we brought those out not too long ago. So in the work that I'm doing with the National Indian Women's Resource Center, we're working on a, uh, as a family advisory council to this national organization. And you could also uh, go and uh, Google them and find out more about the organization. So we advise, uh, uh, we are advisors to the NIWRC. Uh, we represent the voices of tribe, Alaskan Natives and Native Hawaiian families as well. And, we meet regularly and provide input overall. And we've been involved in you know, developing news articles for the Restoration Magazine. It's a wonderful uh, magazine that just covers a, a number of topics. And we're also working on the reauthorization of violence against women, but also other uh, congressional and state legislation as well. And of course, we've all been busy in uh, this week and I'm so glad that the women that are you know, here today all decided to come together to raise awareness, but also continue to uh, support one another all across the state. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so just some preliminary input, and I've been uh, researching and also viewing uh, various podcasts and information, but just to give you an example of what the family members are saying, uh, we see different kind of guides out there. They say you have to wait like 24 hours or 48 hours. And we're saying our recommendations are we, we cannot wait. Just like you heard about the urgency of addressing this. We're not, so we're saying we do not want you to wait when you have to make a, a contact or make a report. And so I heard this one too. If, if that particular law enforcement doesn't respond to you, then seek another law enforcement agency that will take your report. That was very empowering to hear that. And we've always talked about making certain that whoever we reach out, we reach out to enlisted, trusted family or friends for support. 
with the police or the media, the FBI, or whoever you have to talk, talk to. Accept spiritual and cultural support and advice. Important. Record as much as you can all communication with officials. Everything that you talk about. Use basic brief language and communication with family. Gather and track additional information. And families have had to do this. They've had to be their own. Uh, they had to be their own resources when law enforcement wouldn't respond. And they've done their own searches, did everything pretty much on their own. And then preserve all evidence. And then enlist trust and supportive community help as well. The next slide, please. <clears throat> I cannot stress enough the importance you know, of family and the role that you know, they've pursued in terms of trying to get some answers to their questions that they have. Next slide, please. Okay, just current legislative policy highlights. Of course, for as tribes, as a citizen of a tribe, we, we have our Indian treaties, agreements, exec, exec, executive orders, and related kind of documents that are in place uh, uh, with the federal government. And, Basically, it should be the law of the land. They've been in place for many, many years, uh, over 300 years, but they've not been fully honored. And so we'll see when we start taking a look at different legislation with the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, um, which required law enforcement training and investigative assistance by the Department of Justice. However, the Inspector General found this was not a priority for the Department of Justice and a Violence Against Act of of March 17, 2013, was to close critical life-saving gaps in services and justice, and it was to improve services for all victims of domestic violence with sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking, including Native women, immigrants, LGBT, college students and youth, and, and public housing and residents. And I'll go further a little bit to talk uh, further about uh, violence against women and others are we're working on state tribal and federal legislation such as family violence prevention and services act and i'm currently as an educator retired educator of 45 years i've been focusing on the higher education act the elementary secondary education act as well as you know participating in hearings that come along such as the u.s commission on civil rights on this issue and so that advocacy is so important. And it's also important that we're building allies, such as the individuals that are on this, this call today, such as the, with the National Native Women's Resource Center, the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, the National Congress of American Indians, Alliance of Tribal Coalition to End, to end Violence, again, to build capacity of congressional allies and representatives that should be representing us uh, throughout the United States. The next slide, please. And so, okay, go to the next slide, I'm sorry. And so just some resources as I prepare to close here, just, I'm not going to read all of these, but I do want to acknowledge our new secretary uh, for the Department of Interior who has formed a missing and murdered uh, Indigenous unit as the new secretary and just want to highlight I've already named some of the organizations that we've been working with uh, the Department of Justice uh, NamUs uh, internet tool that I've used to input information on my sister and of course the National Indian Women's Resource Center and for those of you who don't know Secretary Holland Deb Holland she's uh, there in the photo in this black suit next slide please A wonderful advocate to have and I just had a family gathering uh, with family, uh, asking them to also share about, you know, what they, they knew or what they recalled of my sister. And so just had a sister's gathering like for them to, oh, he was here. Um, and so he, uh, we, we gathered together on March 25th no, with family up. and with uh, younger ones as well. Next slide. So contact information, basically, uh, this will be uh, available for you as well. I see Patty Gosh is here from the Washington State Patrol. Thank you, Patty, for being with us. And I see also individuals from the National Indian Women's Resource Center. Thank you all for being here and joining us today. Where is he? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
That's, <laughs> it's always interesting doing these things from home. <laughs> my husband disconnected my Wi-Fi earlier today in the middle of a meeting. So um, thank you, Patsy, for sharing all that great work. And next we have Abigail Echohawk, um, who's Pawnee. And I'll ask you to introduce yourself because uh, I won't be able to do it, <laughs> the introduction justice. And then um, I believe you're going to talk about your partnership with the uh, National Indian Women's Resource Center, and then about the local, the Washington State work on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Kate or Valerie, can you help Abigail unmute? You should be able to unmute. There. There you go. All right, thank you so much. Um, and I just wanna raise my hands in gratitude to the women that are on this call. They're my sheroes, they're my rocks, they're the, the strengths um, and having um, Patsy Whitefoot go first. Thank you so much for calling in the memory of your sister, of your loved one, um, of your family. I feel so honored to have just been able to hear what you just said and, and to see the picture of your family. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm Abigail Echohawk. I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma on my father's side, and I was born and raised in the heart of Alaska amongst the upper Atna Athabascan people, where my mom was adopt adopted by my grandma Katie John, the matriarch of Mentasta Lake Village, into that community. I was raised in a community of love, of grace, of compassion, of culture, of tradition, and also of trauma. Um, I identify as a survivor of sexual assault that happened on Indian land and as a result of the maze of jurisdiction, never had the opportunities for what would be seen as justice in other places. Um, this is a world that I have um, lived in and had the opportunity through the strength of the sisters and the families around me, um, including the folks that are on this call today, to move forward in healing and to begin to be able to use the fire in my heart to fight for advocacy for relationships and for justice for our women, no matter where they live. Um, so I'm a sister, I'm an auntie, I'm a mom of two beautiful boys. And right now today, I'm thinking about my nieces um, and how I never want the experiences I've had, the experience other folks have had to ever be what is the future for them. And I will do whatever it takes to ensure that is not the inevitable outcome. But unfortunately, in many of our communities, this is talked about the inevitable outcome, and we have to change that conversation. My organization has focused on, and I have been blessed to do research that, um, including in 2018, where we released what is still today the only national data report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. In that report, we found the things that Teresa was talking about. We also found that Seattle and Tacoma, Seattle ranked number one for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls for the cities we looked at, and Tacoma ranked number seven. Washington State was second of the highest number of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in the country. And here's what I know about that data. It's terrible. It's a gross underreporting. As a result of what we found in that study and what we've known as data advocates for years, I'm a storyteller of health, Western science calls me a researcher, but I follow in the footsteps of thousands of years of indigenous science and storytelling for the good and well-being of our people. That's called Western, uh, Western research calls us um, researchers, but I know I'm a storyteller of health, a storyteller of safety. And in these stories, what we saw in this data was absolute injustice. We saw racial misclassification. In fact, there was a case in Seattle where a Native woman um, was shot and killed in Pioneer Square. After our report came out, she was one of the ones we highlighted as being racially misclassified in SPD data. So SPD was like, oh, we don't think that's a problem. Well, when the Seattle Times questioned them on it and they pulled her up, she was listed as a white woman despite 30 members of her family coming from the Navajo reservation to take her home and then bury her. Despite the visuals that were on the front page of the Seattle Times, she was still classified as a white woman. So even in these numbers, those numbers are nowhere near what is happening within our communities. And so I have been focusing on as a team at the Urban Indian Health Institute and Seattle Indian Health Board, where I have been placed by my family to serve my community right now. Um, and I can't wait until I can move that next young person into this position to serve their community in this role. 
And right now, the Urban Indian Health Institute and the work that we've been putting out has focused on how do we get that information? How do we get into the hands of our tribal leaders and our advocates and our family members for them to push for justice for their families and communities? Washington State had some of the very first legislation that was passed that was supposed to be a look at missing Native women um, in Washington State. It was done by the Washington State Patrol. 10 meetings were held across Washington State where advocates, including myself, Patsy, others stood up, shared stories of both trauma and resiliency. However, the Washington State Patrol did not do us justice by that report. And so my organization redid that report. And what we found when we redid it, when we looked at that data, when we fulfilled what the Washington State Legislature had asked, and by the way, I did that at night in a Starbucks, my other office, um, called on volunteers like my sister, Lael Echohawk, and another colleague, Adrian Dominguez, where they also volunteered so we could do that report. What we found, one of the key findings, is that tribal communities, both urban and rural in Washington state, were asking for a task force. They wanted to bring together tribal leadership, families, community, those involved in making sure that we address this issue from law enforcement to, the, um, to prosecutors, to all the folks involved. They wanted a task force. And that was one of the key recommendations that came out of our report, which we titled MMIWG, We Demand More Effort. And as a result of that report, along with, that's just a small piece of the advocacy folks like Patsy and other tribal leadership, urban and rural have been doing. And then in comes the, the incredible indigenous leadership of Representative Lekanoff, who is then um, is now in the Washington State House to help lead forward this request from our community that came out of those 10 meetings, out of the advocacy, out of the injustice, and the hearts full of fire that our people bring to ensure the safety and well being of those next generations. So, we have been fortunate at the Urban Indian Health Institute to be part of this and working with Representative Lekanoff, Senator Dingra, and others, um, and much gratitude to the folks at. Um, the Attorney General's Office who have set this task force within the Attorney General's Office. We are in deep gratitude and know that this is going to be the right place for us to look towards justice. So I'm on the advocacy part of the get the data, get it in the hands of folks like Patsy Whitefoot. We also have a strong partnership with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and I cannot say enough good things about them. Some of the best people I know, um, they are just furious fiery fighters and also their restoration magazine which i've partnered with them and if you are a native person who would like to get a subscription you can do that for free go to their website if you work for a tribal community you would like one for your tribal agencies please go onto that website and we partner together to get free copies of that restoration magazine because it is so key to telling our stories and putting out resources for folks that we've partnered together and are going to continue to partner together for the safety and well-being of our community. So thank you for letting me share just a tiny bit of a little bit of stories. And Patsy, I just want to say your sister's name again, Daisy May. Her and all of the folks um, that we have lost they matter so much and we carry them in our hearts and our stories and our sacred breath. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, Representative Lekanoff, um, can you introduce yourself? I don't know how much interjection you need and then talk about how we got this, um, this task force in place. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, uh, to my sisters and brothers who I'm sitting here with today, um, it warms my heart to see you all. Uh, Patsy, thank you so much for your guidance. You're an auntie, you're a political strategist, you're a sister, uh, but you're a sister to Daisy May, and I will not forget to say her name. Uh, as the only Native American to serve in the entire state legislature, it was an absolute honor to work with Senator Dingra, to work with Senator Saldana, to work with Representative Entiman, to work with Representative Dye, to work with Representative Moss Booker. We in the state legislature understand that missing and murdered indigenous women and people is not a Republican issue. It is not a Democrat issue. It is an issue and a crisis within Washington state. This is not an Indian country issue. This is a crisis that we must face together 
as legislators and that we must face together in the United States. I raise my hands to Secretary Holland and raising the awareness of making sure that as she transitioned from a Congresswoman into Madam Secretary, she took her values and her teachings of her community with her and she held true to her, her laws of being a Native American woman and incorporated this crisis that they say comes out of Indian country and said, no, this is a United States crisis. And this is something that we need to be addressing as part of our fiduciary and as part of our fiduciary role. I'm really honored to be able to stand with our 29 federally recognized tribes or non-recognized tribes and our urban Native American women who live in Seattle and in Spokane and in areas off the reservation. It was an honor to have Senator Dingra turn to me and say, Deborah, we have a task force that was supposed to be created in 2018. We can do this together. It was incredible to watch her leadership as, a, as an attorney herself raise the awareness to Attorney General Bob Ferguson and say, with your leadership, Bob, and with the, uh, with the role that you have, we can create the task force underneath your agency. We can relieve the Washington State Patrol to address public safety rules that they have and not overburden them, but roll them into the table with us and provide them the support that they've been looking for and the guidance. The task force is wide and it is broad. It includes agency members, it includes legislators, it includes the families that have been lost, it includes federally recognized tribes, uh, it includes urban native organizations. This is a matter that we must all address together as governing bodies. Whether you are a tribal government, a local government, the federal government, whether, whether you are a police officer in any one of those forces, or an investigator, or an attorney, or a prosecutor, or a judge, this is all part of our responsibilities. And bringing all of our governing bodies together and building this effort is really what we need to do. Abigail, you've been an incredible leader of helping us understand the value of data. It is, it, is, it is one of the leading issues that we need to be able to address and streamline through all of our safety, all of our public safety um, uh, doors. But for me, just, you know, in closing, because I know we have a lot of wonderful voices. Um, when my 12-year-old daughter came home from the National Congress of American Indians Youth Council and she learned about MMIW, Right, Patsy, we teach our young children young what this means. She has the, she has the features like you, Vicki. She, she has the features like you. So she, she looked at me and she looked at her and she said, Mom, you're traveling all the time alone. You have to really watch yourself because I don't want to ever lose you. I want you to come home. My young daughter realized that a Native American woman who sounds like me and looks like me I could be picked up just as quickly as any other Native girl. I, um, I raise my hands to all of you. This is an important time for us. It is important for this administration, both uh, within the Biden administration, but in each one of our statehoods. We also are looking to partner with Goya's director, Craig Bill. The Governor's Association is also looking at how missing and murdered Indigenous women and people should be included in every one of the governor's uh, state briefings. Uh, we're looking at incorporating this at every one of the agendas that we can possibly uh, get our hands on to make sure that not just we are talking about this in Indian country, but everybody should be talking about this. So with that, Vicki, I know we've got some beautiful voices to be heard today. We've got some work to get done. Um, and every one of us uh, have a role to play here. And I'm excited to partner with each and every one of you. So thank you, Vicki. We look forward to building new legislation for 2022 with all of you. Thank you. Um, I had a question and there, I think there's also some questions in the chat box, but um, I think it's important to um, share about what we, what we think or what we want to see come out of this task force. And I think you all have maybe expressed some of that, but um, I don't know, Abigail, do you wanna take that question? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, to begin with, 
one of the key things on the task force was ensuring that families were at the table. We have seen way too many conversations, way too many efforts that have not been inclusive of family voices, of people who have actually been affected. And as a result, we've had ineffective solutions that had good intention, but not the right voices at the table. And so um, the inclusion of those family members, along with the respecting of tribal sovereignty and having tribal leaders at the table, um, again, to make sure there aren't being decisions made about us without us. And so that is one of my great excitements for that. And then I'm a total data nerd. Like that's what I do. Um, I always think of these stories of how my relatives gathered data and used it for the good and well-being of our people. And we need to do better in Washington State. So one of my personal things looking forward is both elevating the voice and then how do we get to having better data for Washington State to ensure we're properly capturing race and ethnicity so we understand the scope of the problem. And I'm just gonna put out a project that I'm currently undergoing right now with King County um, and King County prosecutor, elected prosecutor, Dan Satterberg, where um, we've actually worked to reform the King County prosecutor's office, which was missing 58%, about 58% of all of their victim data. And we have worked to reform their data systems to correctly capture race and ethnicity of American Indians, Alaska Natives. Um, we don't, you know, I'm not an expert in any other one. So that's what we've been working on. And we expect, um, we've already launched some of those changes. I'm going to train his staff here in a couple of weeks. We will provide an example that can be a template that can only be used, not only used in Washington state, but nationwide. So my other hope is the folks who come to the table can have the heart for justice that I've seen in Dan Satterberg and his team to let a community organization, an urban Indian organization, lead the change. And so as we come together as this task force with the broad representation that Representative Lekhanov talked about, we have the opportunity to lead change, create national standards, and to ensure not a single one of our loved ones is mis misrepresented. And we also work towards not just talking about how we die, but how is it that our communities live and thrive. Thank you. Um, Patricia, Teresa, do either one of you want to share about what you hope from this task force? I'll let Teresa go. She has to leave early. Teresa, go okay. ahead. I don't know how you can add on to what Abigail shared. Um, honestly, I mean, she hit all of it. Really, when we talk about the task force, we have to talk about um, the real root of of not have how do we not get justice like why is justice so hard um for native americans and so when you look at the court system the police system and you look at prosecutors choosing to not prosecute cases because they're not clear cut they're they're difficult they're hard or it's only one person and that's not a major case to take on um we really have to look at the court system as well and the police the police training of how they're taking responding to calls um and treating victims when they come up apart come to them I mean, you really have to dive into all of it. And then you have to go into education and prevention. Um, I just asked on Facebook a link to what's your favorite or go to training for um, sexual consent. So are we teaching our young people what consent is? If you are 14, you cannot give sexual consent to an 18-year-old. That's illegal. You know, these conversations need to be more normal. And if we know statistics of sexual abuse in children, the majority are done by a family member. Why do we think family are going to educate, educate us on sexual abuse? And so we have to go farther and more in depth than we think we should. Um, issues that we think are private or personal or should be held within the family um, are not true. We, we need to educate. Um, sex ed should be as fundamental as uh, math and science. And um, Montessori, if we can teach children in Montessori how to um, be okay with touch and good touch, bad touch, and who is allowed to touch, um, we need to continue that. And so there's so much um, power in education, yet we're unwilling to do it and we're unwilling to give it freely. 
And so um, I, I just hope it really specters into every aspect because um, there isn't one case there isn't like a this is what happens and then this it 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 doesn't work that way it's it's just like this right and we never know what's that moment of intersection that's going to save a person's life we don't know if it's a moment of interfering in something you see at a gas station if it is a conversation you have with somebody on facebook if it is you see somebody and you just have to talk to them and ask if they need help like we we don't know what's that magical moment and so awareness education broadening our scope and holding those accountable who should be doing the work um, if you are unwilling to prosecute sexual perpetrators and those who commit crimes against women of color you need to get out of the office and you need to get out of that career and find a new place to work and so um, we can no longer give excuses to professional people unwilling to do the work of protecting those who have nothing um, and who have been violated to the core. And so um, I just say, I hope it goes to beyond our expectations. And I have full faith that it will because of the people on this call, um, I know will not be okay with anything less. Patricia, you're muted. There we go. Okay, there. Uh, so I, Teresa covered some of the things I was going to share about the whole intersectionality of this issue. It, there are so many sectors to addressing this issue. And um, because I've been a, a lifelong educator, I also think that there's a lot of work that needs to go on with parents and also children, early, early age with, with our children. And it, you can't do that training though without the parents and families involved. We might take a look at school systems and, and think that schools are gonna be doing this. They're not, schools are not going to do this. And when you take a look at the mission, vision statement of public education, in the statements, they'll say something about family engagement, parent involvement, and all of that. However, does it actually occur? It does not. And so having been in that system for years, I've been also involved with tribal education, public education, higher education. You know, there's so many cross sectors that we're having to take a look at when we take a look at any kind of legislation and so I think that's important what Teresa brought out as well as what uh, you know, Abigail addressed as well. When I've made some public statements, I've also talked about, like Teresa said, police training. What is, where is this training and where does it occur? Most often, you know, the law enforcement have to go off the reservation and go someplace. You know, we don't know how accountable these agencies are uh, to communities. And I, and I began to question, well, Maybe if there were women who were offering that training, it would be different back in the community. What about the role of the Native women being involved in that training, providing that training? And along the same line, I've also made recommendations that perhaps law enforcement needs to just do more outreach and training with Native women. Maybe we need Native women in the law enforcement okay. agencies as well. And so I'm so pleased that, you know, when we worked on the legislation for the state of Washington, we were able to get two women who are now hired and sitting with the Washington State Patrol. Now, I've worked in a state system. I've worked at the superintendent's office previously and had to move away from my home. When I worked in that state system, it wasn't always very friendly. And so I can imagine, and I'm not going to speak for the ladies that are on this call, I can imagine that it's probably been challenging, particularly when you're working in a male dominated system. You know, the systems I've worked in, they've not always been very positive for women. And so you, you would think in you know, public education, it would be, but there are challenges in working in these systems that have been set up you know, to, to protect, to safeguard, to ensure the education and welfare of children and families, that doesn't always occur. And so we really need to, dismantle these colonial systems that have been in place and have, 
we've been subjected to for so many years and, and we've got to just continue them. Um, so uh, that those are the kinds of things that I've talked about in making you know recommendations. And of course, I see a number of recommendations, suggestions that are coming in on the chat and wanna be open to those suggestions and the questions that you have as well. Thank you. Thank you. Could you imagine if every police department had an auntie? <laughs> what a good world it would be. <laughs> it looks like represent. They're asking for grandmas now. So yeah, grandmas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and go to the chat. It's going to be a little awkward because I can't see you guys. Um, but there were some questions in here. There's a lot of great statements, so I hope people are reading these. But um, there was questions about what people can do to support. Um, let's see. There was. I see one about trauma, and I think that yes. we need to take a look at trauma. So today, and all of us are focusing on that. We really have to take a look at, you know, the historical and intergenerational trauma that American Indians, Alaska Natives have experienced in our lifetime and continue to experience today. Um, so much so that in the state of Washington, Washington has uh, begun to take a look at this issue. But when you take a look at the kind of standards that are put in place for our children in public education, those standards don't necessarily fit the standards that we have or some of the values and, and visions that we have on historical and intergenerational trauma in our children. Public education doesn't use that term, historical or intergenerational trauma. They use social emotional learning. So, I mean, and we understand historical trauma. We understand intergenerational trauma, why it's so, so difficult to have that kind of conversation do we have to be so formal that we can't have this conversation about the impact of colonization on, on who we are as indigenous peoples of these homelands? So there's so much, and I appreciate the comment that was made um, by an individual. Thank you. And Patricia, I... Oh, is it okay if I jump in really quick about the trauma? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it's so key. It is absolutely key. So in 2018, we also released another report. And it was on sexual violence on Native women in Seattle, the 94% who had been um, sexually assaulted in their lifetime out of the almost 150 we talked to. But what came out of that was not just the rates of sexual assault um, with the earliest, the average um, age of first assault was 13 years old. But what came out of that is after those assaults, we were able to show that there was increased suicidality, um, homelessness, substance misuse, all of the things that are placed on our people where we don't, we aren't talked about as in being traumatized. And so our people use these as coping mechanisms during the incredible pain that they are experiencing. When I see my loved ones experience this pain, I can feel that pain with them. And because we aren't coming from a trauma-informed place, from healthcare to law enforcement to everything that touches our people that doesn't understand that historical trauma that was just being talked about, we end up re-traumatizing our people and they find other coping mechanisms that are also can be detrimental to their health and well-being. And so when we see this happening, these are what are called the risk factors for people who are likely to go missing or become murdered. We need to go upstream and begin to address that historical trauma, make it common words that we say, recognize that we have to bring back and talk about the life in our communities, the culture, the resiliencies that facilitates historical healing. Because as Native people, we know we can heal backwards to where our ancestors experienced that. So I can be strong, whole, and present in the future so I can sing songs for my children's children. That is where we're going as a community. And today my organization released a report on sexual assault survivors in 26 cities across the United States, where they told us, what do they need to heal? And the number one thing was cultural resources, cultural healing. And I will tell you, having worked in this world, that is one of the least funded things that we can get into our communities. And so our survivors have spoken, Who's listening? Thank you, Abigail. I wanted to add that um, a few years back, we were in a meeting with uh, DSHS talking about um, having making sure that they include historical trauma in the services they provide. And they said 
and I know that the person who said this just used poor wording, but they just said historical trauma isn't a thing. And it was like the most damaging thing that you could say to a room full of tribal leaders and staff. And so because of that, we passed the Indian Behavioral Health Act last year with the help of some of the legislators that are here today and Senator McCoy. And it includes the um, de a definition of historical trauma and a definition of resilience in um, state, in Washington state law and the RCW, which we think is an important step forward in starting to include and incorporate that in, in um, you know, training and services and all that. So I just wanted you to know that we did that work. So there's something to fall back on now. Don't let them tell you it's not a thing. <laughs> I also just wanted to highlight uh, the fact in my case with my sister, she lived uh, in Oregon and Warm Springs on the Warm Springs Reservation. And uh, the point I want to make about that is that our families are very migratory as well. We're, we don't, we're not just on the reservation. Uh, the story I've told about her, she traveled a lot as a young woman traveling, you know, throughout the Northwest playing Indian ball, playing basketball and softball. She excelled. And, and in that, you know, in her journeys or in her pathways, you know, she came upon family members. It wasn't unusual for her to stay with family members. And when I think about the work that we're doing in schools as well, our children are also traveling and families are traveling in a migratory way you know, living our, our traditional ways of life by food gathering different places. It wasn't unusual for me as a child to have my grandmother taking us around the Northwest just to do food gathering, to go fishing, to go hunting, to go berry picking down in Eugene area, you know, all, all around the place and, and up in Canada. I mean, it, our, our families, uh, you know, are very mobile as well. And I think in this particular topic as well as related topics, we need to be mindful of that, that uh, we're not just restricted to our reservations, although people might think that, uh, there's just so much misunderstanding about that too. But just wanna acknowledge, you know, the role and the fact that we continue to carry out our traditional ways of life and that we're not just situated on, on the Yakima reservation or, or the reservations and we're very mobile, moving into the urban community as well and then crossing these imposed boundaries on us, you know, such a state government, and which is what state government does too, is put those boundaries in and, and doesn't have this education about who we are as indigenous peoples of this land. Thank you. The, um, if it's okay, I've got a few questions now that um, the staff has gathered. So if I just wanna throw them out there and if you wanna take them, go ahead. The first one is, hi, I'm looking for ways to get active to help this cause, looking for volunteer work. Any suggestions? I suggest that folks take a look at the National Indigenous Women's Reef Center has a toolkit for um, addressing MMIW within your communities. That is also a toolkit that can be used by allies. It gives you resources and pass forward. Um, as you think about locally, know that there are incredible advocates and organizations, a lot of things on social media, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Um, so MMIW USA is one to follow. There's an incredible organizer here located in Seattle by the name of Roxanne White who also does a lot of organizing and work. So look in social media, you can actually find some really great resources and then some solid, really thinking about how to address it in your community. There's a whole toolkit with our friends at the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center that I definitely suggest folks take a look at. Thank you. Another question, I asked that we have some strong some strong support within school districts and colleges and universities for programs that assist and help our indigenous children and young women and advocate for strengthening or calling for supports where it is missing. Thank you for advocating and indigenous women for your leadership. I guess that wasn't a question. Here's a question, <laughs> but thank you for the comment. I hear from some people that this is a male issue more than a women's issue because of some stats that are more male, that more males are missing? Is this a way to minimize the gender violence with flawed missing data? Um, so uh, I always think about the, the words that were shared with me from Lucy Simpson, who's the executive director of NIWRC. We're talking about them a lot because they're that good. Um, but one of the things in our communities is women are safe. 
And when we heal where our women is, it flows out from who we are as culture bearers, as the bearers of the next generations, along with other people who birth, we bring that out. Um, and so when we heal our women, we heal our whole communities. MMIWG as a movement is not exclusionary to other gender identities, including men. And in fact, what we recognize in that movement is the intersectionality of being indigenous and being a woman. Um, and we know that there is distinct um, risk factors that I always say are not at risk because we're indigenous or women, but because we live in a country and in a world that has been seeking to oppress us and as indigenous people literally kill us um, for centuries. And so the MMIWG movement and the words that we use in that are not exclusionary. And I think sometimes people outside of our communities who don't know our cultural ways and that we are all connected may see it as such. But this is a, a cultural, traditional understanding of women being sacred, our LGBTQ plus people as sacred people. And that when we heal from within there, we recognize it impacts our entire community as a whole. And we recognize that our brothers do experience um, going missing and murdered. And it's an issue of the entire community. And there's absolutely space and place for all of our indigenous people, regardless of gender identity, to be part of this movement. Um, asked about MIWRG, Rose Quilt just posted on the chat. She's uh, listed there and you can also, you see her email address as well. Thank you, Rose, for being with us. Thank you. Another question, okay. What can faith-based congregations do? We are a small lay-led fellowship. We aspire that the native land acknowledgement that we receive becomes far more than a token or an end. Thank you. I think maybe you answered that with the resources and the... And so I'm involved with the uh, Faith Action Network here in the state as well. And so work with them because they are also advocates at the state level and recognize the kind of resources and support that they can provide. So please reach out to your congregations and, um, you know, if you have any questions, again, please, uh, I'm going to re refer you to Rose and she'll connect back to us. Rose Quilt, <laughs> she's on the line. <laughs> um, and I, again, ahead. shout out to my niece. I see her again here. Hi, Tara. Wave to me. <laughs> she's from Wy Wyoming. She, te she teaches there. So Tara Suppa from the Warm Springs Tribe. And Vicki, I think um, just joining, uh, thank you for our faith-based community question. Uh, those of us who are in the state legislature, um, we often get uh, incredible visits, voices um, that are shared through emails and phone calls and letters uh, from the community. So thank you, Patsy, for reminding them, reach out to your faith-based communities because they have a strong presence down in the state legislature and they will come knocking on uh, Senator Dingress, Senator Saldana and Representative Entenmann's door. And we open the door and welcome them in and they have great incredible uh, voices and ways to which they collaborate and share um, common policy platforms. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I guess one more question to clarify the county jails. Oh, there, it's a two part question. County jails self report and many are located in, uh oh, it moved. <laughs> in counties that prey on BIPOC. Is there any data if the state of Washington reimburses county jails? I'm sorry, the question keeps moving. And now I lost it. Um, I will say, Vicki, that that's not an area I can um, talk about. I don't know enough about it, that to say mm -hmm. anything with um, relatives, you know, being sure. Okay, thank you. Well, and there's lots of great comments in the chat box. I hope you guys have been able to see some of them. Um, and as uh, Kate has said, that uh, the Women's Commission will put out a blog with all of the resources that were shared here. There was a question about the Indian Behavioral Health Act. I'll get that to Kate so she can include that. Um, any final 
thoughts or words that any of you want to give? I'd like to just acknowledge Vicki's role with the Washington State Women's Commission. So, so glad that she's on the board there. I quickly looked up, you know, information and I was glad that there was a position and that representation I think needs to be not only statewide, but we also need re regional and of course, federal representation as well from, from our area, from Washington State or the Northwest. And so any opportunity uh, please call upon us. We can make recommendations of individuals that we know of in our communities that could be, you know, at these places and at these tables where important decisions are being made. And I, again, just want to uh, call out the fact that we have our Washington State Patrol representatives here with us and the national organization too. So I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us. I really appreciate, I can't believe the number of people that are on here. So thank you so much. Thank you. That doesn't count the people watching live on Facebook too, apparently. Um, so more than you see. Abigail, do you have final thoughts? Uh, I just want to say again, um, come to us because we have the answers, not just because you think we have the problems and the problem lies in our, or the um, solutions lie in our stories, our elders, our youth and in the land. And we have the answers to these, um, these problems and we just need the support and allyship of those around us to move forward to safety for all people. Thank you. And Thank Representative Buckenau. I, I was just gonna say in closing, um, all of you who are listening to us today, thank you for joining your hands together and raising them with us. Um, Abigail, you're absolutely right. Our, our urban native organizations, our tribes have all come together in the past uh, 10 years and developing our capacity to be able to develop what the appropriate next steps are. Abigail will sit next to me and she will draft out the legislative policy work that needs to be done to be able to move this at the state level. And then Vicki will grab it, read it, go through it, get a hold of Senator Dingra, Senator Kaiser, Senator Saldana, Representative Entman, Representative Mossbooker, and we will have legislation being written by our Native American people. And we know what needs to get done and we do it together. The task force took us almost, I would say Abigail, a few years to nail it and to bring it together and to, to create it and to define it. And we're now in a really good place to be able to move forward. So remember, we don't need uh, folks to build laws for us. We need folks to build laws with us. And that we're very excited to have. And I wanted to pause, Vicki. I saw that Representative um, Entman had her hand raised a little bit. And it's good to see you. You got two Debras today. So I wanted to see if she wanted to share a few words before we left. Um, Kate, can you find Representative Entman or Valerie? I think, can she? Raise her hand, I'm maybe. On it. I just made oh. you a co-host representative, Entman. If you, um, you should be able to unmute yourself and let me spotlight you so everyone can see you. There you go. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you very much, Representative Lakana and Representative Sel uh, Sen and Senator Saldana. First of all, I want to say thank you for um, hosting this today. It's been just eye-opening and I know that it's very important. I wanted to say that I wanted to offer um, any assistance that I can provide um, as a member of the Black Member Caucus because I think that our, our relationships are tied together. And so together we can go much further than going alone. I also think that it is important to, um, I wanted to ask this question because I come from about 12 years working at the federal level and we used to hear this reasoning a lot as to why there was a problem about um, investigating these particular incidents. And it was always a question of who has jurisdiction. Has that been uh, settled? Is there, have we moved forward from always having the conversations about whether it is a federal crime or whether it is taken care of at the local level? Because I know in the past, we used to hear that often. And I'm just curious about if that is still a problem, um, how we can start to work on that as well. Um, that continues to be a consistent problem. Again, speaking as a woman who is directly affected by that, 
and my sexual assault that did not get prosecuted as a result of this maze of jurisdiction. Um, and I do not speak as an individual. I speak as part of a collective of thousands of Native people, if not hundreds of thousands, who experience the exact same thing. Um, and I just want to point out that this issue of maze of jurisdiction is what institutional and structural racism looks like, because all they do is sit and have conversations for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, while we continue to be assaulted, where we continue to die, and we continue to go missing. Um, and so that's what it looks like. We have seen some forward movement with the passing of Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act, and NIWRC continues to lead in the advocacy um, around the Violence Against Women Act, which at the federal level does allow for um, thinking about undoing some of the, the maze of jurisdiction. Um, and again, I thank NIWRC for the continued work they do in pushing this forward. It is what institutional and structural racism looks like. And I am the direct result in my experiences of that. I appreciate you sharing your story. And um, I think that it would be interesting to, to start on some of that work. Um, at the state level and then see if we can move it to the federal level. I just, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done, but I'd like to have a place to start. And I think that will be my, my. We've been, sorry, we've been working a little bit on that in the um, behavioral health crisis realm and trying to kind of suss that out. And I think the first thing that would um, be helpful is the repeal of public law 280. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's a big thing, but it's also something that's um, very, um, it's part of structural racism. And then, yeah, really understanding jurisdiction and it shouldn't matter, a crime is a crime, a murder is a murder. Right. We should be working together instead of saying not it, you know, but thank you. Thank you, I'm sure we'll be calling on you. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity and just to be able to listen today. Thank you. And I think if there's no other comments, you think the most appropriate way we could end is by saying her name. And so if you will all join me in saying it, you don't have to unmute, you can type it in, but let's just all say together, one, two, three, Daisy May. Heath, say her name. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate you joining us. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us.